Welcome to the Gentleman Project podcast. This morning, I am Kirk Chug. And I'm Corey Moore. Today, we have one of my very, very good friends, Mr. Brad Ross. Uh, we've known each other for quite some time. I don't know, maybe 15, 20 years at least. Long time. Yeah, a long time. I asked Brad to be on because we do a lot of business together, but uh, we were just talking before we started the podcast about if, if we're not talking business, we're talking family. And Brad loves his kids more than anything. I know that about him. So I was like, you got to be on this podcast, Brad, please. And so he was nice enough to say yes. So thanks for coming, Brad. Well, thank you for having me. Brad, tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you do professionally? I uh, manage and uh, develop commercial real estate for um, a gentleman by the name of Kern Schumacher. Uh, He's the largest industrial developer in the state of Utah. And uh, we have assets all over the West and I help him oversee and manage them. Very cool. So how long have you been doing that? Uh, 30 years. Cool. Long time. <laughs> he doesn't even look old enough to be doing that. No, he years. doesn't. I was a kid when I started. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very cool. And tell, so tell us a little bit about your family. How many kids do you have? I have four kids, two daughters, uh, two girls, two boys. Uh, the girls are 25, 23, and the boys are 18 and 16. Corey and I are both around that uh, 14 to 16 with some of our kids too. And uh, instead of fun and interesting time you've been to it through it now three going on four times yes i think it's i think it's harder as a kid as a teenager into their 20s than it is when they're a toddler and a newborn how so what have you learned well i I just think it's uh the life's challenges are so so great and uh you try to prep them and you try to help them and 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 teach them and hope they have the, what it takes to survive. And, um, you know, when they call you and they come to you and they're, you know, stressed about college and stressed about work and stressed about paying rent and, you know, these are life lessons they've got to learn. Yeah. But I've got four great kids. So cool. What are their names? Do you mind? Uh, Madison's 25, uh, McCall's 23 and Brody's 18 and Boston is 16. Cool. So Madison is a financial analyst for a commercial mortgage company. And McCall is, uh, she went to cosmetology school. Um, she's thinking about going to school to become an elementary uh, school teacher. And she's a manager at a, at a coffee shop. And Brody, my 18 year old just finished high school at Corner Canyon. And, uh, he started college and, um, entering the workforce part time. So he's excited. And Boston, my 16 year old, he is uh, going into his junior year at Corner Canyon and, playing football and going to wrestle. Cool. He's following his brother's footsteps and being the student athlete. So was dad a wrestler too? A uh, dad wrestled one day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and there's I, a story behind this. <laughs> <laughs> so I played, played football and the, the, they're like, you need to come in and wrestle. This is my freshman year. And I said, well, I'll come in and watch, but I have no interest in wrestling. <laughs> And they said, well, just come on and, and let's see where it goes. So I went in there and I had my jeans and a t-shirt and I wrestled for one day. And I said, I will never do that again. <laughs> I'm not strong enough. I'm not a strong enough person to be a wrestler. I learned that. I learned that in 45 minutes. That's awesome. <laughs> it's a good story. Well, <laughs> but, but in hindsight, I wish I would have, because the life lessons that you can learn as a wrestler uh, will, will affect you the rest of your life. And I've seen it firsthand with my oldest boy. And I think that is why my younger boy wants to wrestle. Let's talk about that. What do you think you learned from, from wrestling? Uh, hard work pays off. Um, it's not easy. Uh, wrestling is probably one of the hardest things that I've witnessed firsthand with my boy. Um, what they go through mentally and physically. Um, you have to be mentally strong to be able to be wrestle. Uh, you know, and, the, and I owe all the credit in the world to the coach at Corner Canyon, Coach Jeff Year. He's an amazing man. And uh, he probably could have done a lot of things in his life, professionally in sports. But he chose to be a wrestling coach and a baseball coach at the high school to help young men become men. Mm. And, uh, you know, I told him when Brody was a freshman that you're teaching these boys life lessons that they don't even know they're learning. Discipline, hard work, focus, uh, treating people with respect. And the list goes on and on. Yeah. You know, your boys, in, in my mind, in my interaction and in talking to you, your boys have those qualities. They seem like, now I know they're teenagers and I'm sure it's not always that way, but they seem somewhat, they seem very self-motivated in a lot of ways. And like they, you know, they have goals, they go after them. 
your boys? Where does, and maybe your girls are that way too. I just don't know them as well, but where do you think that comes from or how did that come about in your mind? Well, my girls are the, are the same. I mean, they, uh, they set their mind to something and they go do it. I think it's, I think it goes back to the way I was raised um, with my parents and I've got three older sisters. You know, my parents taught us that the most important thing you can do is work. And, you know, and, and I think as a parent, you have an obligation to, a ch- to teach your children how to work. Because if you don't, what have you, you failed them? I mean, they, how are they going to survive if they don't know how to work hard? When I was a teenager, 11, 12, 13, I was working with my brother-in-law in doing landscaping. And uh, I remember one of the neighbors came and asked my dad, how did you get your boy to work? I mean, I think you, I mean, you can teach people how to work, but you have to have it inside your soul and to want to work. And, uh, you know, I remember that day, like it was yesterday. I was like 13 years old, 12 years old. And uh, I was like, wow, he wants to know how, because he's like, I don't know how to teach my kids how to work. And I think you teach by example. Yeah. I remember when I was uh, eight years old, I would go to work with my dad a couple of days during the summer. And uh, I think he dreaded it, but he always had a smile on his face and said, yeah, you can come to work with me tomorrow. And we'd go to, I'd run around the warehouse, I'd go torment the office, and he'd say, it's time to get to work. And he would grab a broom, would put it in the car. He worked up at uh, up in Clearfield in the warehouses up there. He managed a uh, public warehousing company. And he'd go, put me in the car, would go drive down the street, he'd drop me off. He said, I'd pick you up for lunch, and I'd, I'd have to sweep the street. <laughs> and then we'd go to lunch, and he'd come back and take me to another street, and he says, I'll pick you up when it's time to go home. And, uh, you know, did I really need to sweep the street? Probably not. Because you couldn't tell if I did anything or not, but I swept the street for, you know, six, seven hours a day. And, you know, then he'd pay me, you know, I'd make $10 or whatever. And I remember one day I was eight years old, we were coming down and I said, Dad, I want to go to Uwena Golf and I want to buy a putter. And went to Uwena Golf and I bought a Ping Answer putter. It cost me like 40 bucks. And I've still got it in my office today. I don't play with it, but it's just a reminder of what I did to earn that putter sweeping streets at eight years old. Yeah. It means something to you. It means a lot. That's really cool. I, Corey has been up to uh, our property up in the mountains. And I remember going up there as a kid and I remember my grandfather trying really hard to tell me that work doesn't have to be drudgery. Uh, work can be fun and he led by example because he'd rather be out on the fence line fencing all day long than at Disneyland and he would tell me that and he would have fun and I I looked at him and thought you know everybody else thinks work is supposed to be some type of punishment but he really found a lot of satisfaction in being out doing work and then we'd stand back and look at the fence and go look how straight that fence is we can be proud of that job so now I've got a piece up there and we're fencing it. I'm fencing it with my boys and he's still around and he's teaching my boys the same thing he taught me that he learned from his dad. And it's just this really, really cool, you know, my boys like to go to the ranch and we like to work and we go up on the weekends. And if I don't have a project plan for them, they're bored. Well, that's good. So I, I, I think that we all have those people in our lives that set an example of work doesn't have to be a punishment. And I think if we treat it as a punishment and if we come home and complain about work, our kids are also going to do the same thing. Like we were talking before, we raise our kids sometimes the way we're raised. That's like the default, right? Unless we change it or learn something from it. So, um, I mean, I think, I think work can be very rewarding. Um, you know, you set goals and when you accomplish the goals and you look back and you're like, wow, look what we did. It's pretty incredible. My guess is your sons will be teaching their boys how to set fence. I think it'll probably be an important thing to them. Right now, they're down at a neighbor's house that they went down to this morning. They've been hired by four or five people in our neighborhood, and they go of their own free will. I don't make them go, and they work two to three hours every morning, hard labor. And they make 10 bucks an hour. That's great. And But I, they go do it. You know, they're like, what else am I going to do today? You yeah, know? right. So I said, you got the summer to earn some money to do whatever you want to do with. And, and I'm proud of them because they go and they do it on their own. I don't make them go. 
Ten dollars an hour, and I was sweeping streets for ten dollars <laughs> a day for six hours. Yeah. <laughs> well, Brad, talk to us a little more about because um, I know your dad pretty well. Your dad pretty well, and and he was such a great guy. Talk to us about some of the things maybe that George taught you, um, and then why you. How did he create that closeness that you guys had? You know, because you guys were tight. We were very tight, and uh, you know, I was fortunate to have the opportunity to work with my father for. 28 years. Uh, we lost him last February. This past February to a horrible disease, Alzheimer's. <clears throat> and it was hard to watch uh, him go through the process and how he loved to do, he was, he was no longer able to do the things that he uh, was able to do because of the disease. And, uh, you know, but, but growing up, watching my dad, um, you know, he always treated me with respect um, my whole life. He treated everybody with respect. And uh, George was a true gentleman. Um, he, uh, I remember I came home one night um, in high school. Um, I got home when he was going out and going jogging Saturday morning. And we met at the garage, and he said, hey, maybe next time, why don't you give me a call? I said, Dad, that's fair. Dad says, go get some sleep, and we'll go do something later. That was all that was said. You know, I think it's the respect factor. I mean, he, he knew I wasn't doing anything stupid, and he trusted me. And, uh, you know, I think parents, you know, I've seen it with friends. Um, when I was growing up, the parents that don't trust their kids it usually doesn't work real well. But because of the trust, I never did anything. Um, I tried not to do things that uh, would jeopardize that trust. Because once it's broken, it's hard to get back, as we all know. But my father um, was a very kind man. Um, he always had a smile on his face. And uh, he loved work. And he always used to tell me, never stop your education. Do more than your employer requires. But he did that. I mean, he, 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 everything he did was above and beyond. He worked hard. Um, he had a lot of respect from the people in the industry and he never sought it. Um, you know, George was, was a guy that just went to work and did what he did and he was, had a very successful career. Uh, you know, it's funny. I remember going to school, people were, would ask you, you know, how do you define success? You know, and everybody wants to run the big company and everybody wants to make a lot of money. And all that's great because we all have, you know, goals and, you know, that's the way you support your family. But watching my father, I mean, people would ask me, how do you define success? And I said, if I could raise a happy family and have just never put him in jeopardy, I'd consider that a success. You know, something happened in 2014 that probably changed the way I look at a lot of things. Um, I got sick and uh, had a minor heart attack and um, ended up having triple bypass. And, uh, you know, kind of ref I kind of paused and reflected, who am I and what am I doing? In business up to that point, it was, uh, it was black and white and there was no emotion and nothing was going to get in the way of getting something done. And hindsight, um, I don't think that's the way it needs to be. And in 2014, you know, I tried to f follow my father's example and treat people with respect. Not that I wasn't before, but if something got in the way, they were, I was just going to blow them over because something, you know, we had to get the job done. I was tough. I was really tough. After, after the, the, the episode and going through that, um, you just kind of change your, your thought process and realize what's important. And winning every deal might not be as important as setting an example to your family. Have you talked to your kids about that? Like after you went through that experience, have you talked to your kids about their perception of life and that kind of how that changed you? I think they've seen it firsthand. I think a lot of things don't need to be said. Sure. It's really hard to talk about what happened. Um, I have a lot of guilt that is seven years and I still have it. Um, it's nothing I did wrong. Um, genetics, but I put a lot of people 
through a lot of things, um, you know, dealing with that. And, uh, you know, it's hard. It's hard. The hardest thing I have ever done in my entire life. I had surgery on a Wednesday. And uh, Tuesday night, um, when it was time to put the kids to bed, I spent time with each one of them and just hugged them. And told them how much I loved them. Because I didn't know what was going to happen on Wednesday. Was I going to have a chance to hug them again? You know, my wife at the time, we, you know, I had to do the same thing with her on, on going into the surgery. It's hard. It was, was that it? Was that goodbye? I remember when I woke up and I was like, I get to spend another day with my kids. And like I said, I put a lot of things in perspective that, uh, you know, maybe I don't need to do the things that the way I did the things I did before, and maybe we could all work together and have the same result. And uh, I think, you know, I think it's important that my kids saw how hard I worked, and the things that I went through, and the travel, and the late nights, and the early mornings. But I also think it's probably more important to see what happened after I had the episode and I went through and to see um, how you can still get the things done that you need to get done. And, you know, at the end of the day, you can shake their hand and you can go to lunch. I remember we were doing a deal in California. A packing, large packing company had a land lease or a building on our, on our land and had a termination clause and we wanted them to buy it. And they wouldn't listen and they wouldn't participate. So we finally ended up having to cancel their lease. And we had a meeting with the attorney and the buyer was there and we came to terms. And at the end of the meeting, the attorney says, well, that turned out great. Why don't we all go to lunch? And I was like, were you at the same meeting as the rest of us? <laughs> and uh, you know what? We all went to lunch. And that was kind of the beginning of... Um, you know, I don't think you just have to go in and step on everybody's throat every chance you get. And um, do I want to be known as that guy? And I probably was for a while. Well, I think you've spoken to a lot of fathers today and maybe mothers too who have had, maybe not have had that life-changing event yet, but maybe need that wake-up call of, I could do things differently. There are some things that I, I can do to engage more um, and maybe have those answers come in a, in a different way without having to have a surgery and a heart attack. And, um, so I, I just want to thank you for sharing that. Um, that's a, you can tell that that's a tender spot for you in your life. Um, and, and I think it would be for anybody to have that experience with their kids. Um, I'm sure your kids remember that. Um, I don't think they'll ever forget. Yeah. It was a scary time. A very scary time. Well, and that would have been, I mean, your youngest would have been nine, right? Nine or ten? Yeah. Yeah. You know, but, but when you go through something like that, you realize the people um, in your life and what they mean to you and how your friends rally and pass on their support and their prayers. And uh, I remember a friend of my dad's called him from Louisiana and my dad, Dad told him what was going on, and uh, he called back a few days. He says, how's your son? I've been praying for him. It's probably the first time in my life where I truly felt that you could, I mean, the, the you know, people talk about how you can feel the power of prayer, and I truly felt it. I felt it, and I felt it for, I mean, you could just tell, like, the guy in Louisiana was praying for me and my family and, you know, everybody in between, and it, it was an amazing experience. This really, I do think, is a good summation of 
a bit about of who you are, or at least the way I see you, Brad. Brad is a, um, he's no nonsense. He's brutally honest. He, but he's also fair, right? He has those things that he's fair and he cares about people more than all of that, especially his family and friends. And I think I'm seeing how, how you've become who you are, right? Like he's really hardworking. He's, he's brutally honest. You know exactly where you stand with him at any given moment. He know he will tell you what the goal is. And, but today my experience with you over the last five years has been, but I'm going to be fair. And if there's people issues, um, we're going to talk about that first. And I think, I think it has defined and made you such a well-rounded gentleman. I think it's worked. I want to ask you about, um, cause, cause you kind of did this, not the same, but then you had COVID that <laughs> hit you really hard. Was that, were you, I hadn't asked you this before, but were you thinking, oh my heck, we're doing this again at all? Or where was your head at through the COVID thing and how did that change you? So yeah, last August, uh, got diagnosed with COVID. Um, my ex-wife got it. I got it. Both boys had it and both girls ended up having it. The whole family had it. And, uh, Julia, my, my ex-wife, um, she, uh, she got hit really hard. I got hit hard. My 18 year old son Brody was playing football, um, working out every day, lifting like a machine. Uh, in the best shape of his life, ended up with COVID and lost 22 pounds in 10 days. He would walk upstairs, get a piece of bread, go back downstairs and go to bed. I kept counting the days like, okay, I got day 10, I'm out of quarantine. Well, day 10, I, and, and Julia, like I say, she got hit really hard. And uh, I remember she came over to my house, we were sitting on the kitchen floor, like, what is going on? Because we couldn't talk to anybody else. And, uh, you know, she was a trooper. She, um, she rallied, she... Uh, matter of fact, the morning of day 10, when I woke up and I said, oh, great, I get to get out of quarantine. But my oxygen was 82. Mm. So I called her and I said, hey, uh, Julie, I think I should probably go to the hospital. And so she she came over and, uh, you know, and took me to the hospital. And, 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 and backing up, you know, things didn't work out for us, but she's a dear friend and I will always love her. And uh, I mean, she's the mother of my children. And I contribute, I give her as much credit for my success as anybody because she was there and she was the one that was picking up the pieces when I was, you know, trying to get established. So we went to the hospital. I had the x-ray. I had a CT scan and the doctor or the nurse came in and told Julia is like, uh, the doctor would like to speak with you. And she went out and talked to the doctor and the doctor and she came back in. She's like, well, you're heading to St. Mark's. They're going to admit you into the hospital. So they put me in an ambulance and away we went. So I get to, I get to the, the hospital. I walk in, I, you know, they wheel me into a room. Um, it's 12 feet by 18 feet. Um, I spent 11 days there. Corey called me one day or sent me a text. He says, uh, our mutual friend, John and I want to, FaceTime you. I said, Corey, I appreciate that, but I can't talk. My oxygen, every time I would talk, my oxygen would drop to 80. And I was on supplemental oxygen. Uh, I did the remdesivir. I did the plasma. Uh, they would come in every morning, the doctors and, and the nurse, and they would say, we've got this new treatment. What do you think? I said, let's get something set, established like right now. I don't care what it is. I don't care if you found it in the janitor's closet. I don't care if you found it <laughs> behind the sink, whatever. If you think it's going to help me, just give it to me because I don't care. And every day they'd walk in and they would say, how are you feeling? I said, I'm feeling great. And I'm one day closer to seeing my kids. And um, I spent 11 days in the hospital and the nurses I broke out my day because I'm literally in a room that's 12 by 18. I've got a small window that's probably two feet wide and four feet high. I could see the corner of a building, and that was it. Um, you weren't allowed visitors. Uh, my, my sisters would bring, uh, you know, snacks over and drop them off. Um, 
the nurses would come in at 7.30 in the morning uh, to bring breakfast in to check my vitals. I would take a shower every day at 10.30. Lunch came in at 12.30. The doctor would come in at 2.30 and I had dinner at 5.30. And I broke my day into two-hour increments because it gave me something to look forward to. It's like I can't wait for the nurse to come in to, to check my vitals. I can't wait for the doctor to come in because I have somebody to talk to. Hmm. Um, I sat there on oxygen. It was hard. I missed my son's, both son's football games. Um, I would, luckily they streamed the varsity game. Um, I would watch it on my computer. I would text my kids every day. Um, but I couldn't talk. I would talk, my oxygen would drop. I'd take a shower, my oxygen would drop. And the nurse came in one day, and, or the doctor came in and says, well, I think we'll give you a Lasix. It's a water pill. She's like, I have no idea if it'll work, but I was up to 10 liters of oxygen at the time. And uh, one morning I got up to 13 liters. And uh, they came in and gave me a water pill, and I started to, to shed the water. And as I was shedding the water, the oxygen, the supplemental oxygen went down. Um, so I saw that there would be you know, light at the end of the tunnel. The doctor, um, she was she was amazing, and you know the the these healthcare providers that um, sacrificed everything to provide us care. They don't get enough credit, and um, I you know I owe my life. Um, you know the the doctor, she ended up with COVID. She has two daughters that go to judge, and a husband. She moved into a, a hotel, wow, because she didn't want to expose her kids. And I remember when I left the hospital, she says, will you do me a favor? And I said, yes. She says, will you tell everybody you know to wear a mask so I can go see my kids someday soon? Oh. Um, and I thought, here I am in the hospital. I can't see my kids. She's providing me care, and she can't see her kids. But I made it home, uh, recovered, still have, you know, my doctor thinks, you know, you pretty much got scarring on your lungs. You'll probably have to deal with it for the rest of your life. Um, but I wasn't going to let COVID beat me. Um, I stayed positive and the doctor was like, I can't believe how positive you are. I said, well, what other choice do I have? And I I attribute that to my father. I mean, every, you know, the sky is falling and it's the most beautiful day on earth. (laughs) And, uh, but, but, you know, I just knew, I knew I was going to go home and I knew I was going to see my kids. And every day I was just one step closer to seeing my kids. And, uh, you know, the, they went through hell not knowing what was going to happen um, because nobody knew, knows what's going to happen. I mean, the stories that I heard in the hospital are frightening um, from marathon runners on ventilators to six-year-old kids in ventilators and, you know, 85-year-old women on supplemental oxygen. And, you know, it's just the, the unknown was just scary. Um you know, and, and, and COVID, uh, you know, I didn't work a lot. I uh, had a lot of time to think. And um, when you're in a room staring at yourself, basically, and you have time to reflect on what's important and, um, and the people in your life that are important and uh, how each of them have impacted me. And um, I've got a support system that is probably second to none. I hope everybody feels that way. Um, But I know for a fact that if anything were to happen to me, that every single one of them in my life would step up and rally and be there for my family. And I decided those are the people that I want to be with. And those are the people that I want to spend my life with. Because they care about me, I care about them. And that's what the world's all about, is showing love and kindness and respect to each other. And the biggest challenge I have with COVID is it robbed me. So I was, I was sick for 10 days. I was in the hospital for 11 days. And they told me to stay away from my parents for at least nine, uh, like 45 days. So I had two months. I was robbed from spending time with my father, who I lost four months later. And with the Alzheimer's, he didn't understand. I remember I got home and my parents came to my house and they sat in the car and I stood on the sidewalk. And he's like, where have you been and what's going on? I miss you. He 
you just couldn't grasp the fact that I was in the hospital and I've got this virus that have affected so many people and so many businesses and so many things. I mean, look how many, look who it's affected. Um, and they've never even had the virus. Their businesses have shut down their school, the kids in school, the, the poor teachers, um, that's the biggest impact, I think, and it's just sad. It's just heartbreaking. Um, but, you know, for me to lose two months with my father, I would do anything to get those two months back. Is there any advice you'd give to those that uh, are dealing with parents that are going through, you know, Alzheimer's type of stuff? I mean, you, you, to give some context, you know, George in his 80s is going and playing golf with us, and he's good. You know, like he was very active, very, um, involved in the business late into longer than most people would be in their career. He worked till how old was he? 78, 78. And was, I mean, as sharp as anyone is sharp at that age, trust me <laughs> and very active. Um, and then quickly it turned, right? So is there advice you would give to, others whose parents are going through things like that? Um, yeah, it's hard because, um, you know, the, with, with Alzheimer's, you know, the person like my mother, who was the primary caregiver, you know, my dad would, would be focused on something and the, his brain isn't working right. And he would never let it go. He'd be fixated on something for 24 hours. And my mother would just call me and be like, I can't do it. What is going on? I need some help. Um, you know, I can't get him to, to stop. I'd go up. My sisters would go up. You couldn't change his mind. I remember he called me one day and said, uh, it's time to go to church. And it's Saturday. And he's in his church clothes. And uh, I said, well, Dad, we don't have church today. It's Saturday. And um, he's like, well, none of you guys know what you're even talking about. I'm just going to walk up there. So he got out of the house and started, he was going to walk to church. Luckily, he didn't go very far. Um, but, you know, patience. Patience is the big thing. And then um, and just cherishing the moments that you have, even though um, they might not be there. There might be a nugget that is tossed out that day where you can cherish and you can hold on to it. Um my my oldest son Brody was uh, he was wrestling and my 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 father always made it to my boys and and he and he supported the girls in dance and and whatever but but he he loved to go watch them play football and he would talk about oh that play and he would break down the game and we just you know he's so proud of the boys for being a, you know part of a team and in January Brody had or maybe it was early February doesn't matter. It's January. He he had divisionals um, to qualify for state. It was a two day tournament, and it went, if you placed, then you qualified, which he did. Um, and so I went and t- talked to my dad after I got back. The, it was it was up in is up in Roy, so there's two days where I couldn't see him. And the the day after, I went up there and I said, Dad, I said Brody wrestled, and I said let's watch the video. And, and we're talking at this point, there was not a lot there. He was very, um, we never, we didn't have a lot of lucid moments and um, not even a lot of conversations. Um, answer questions, really tired, slept a lot, wouldn't get out of bed. Um, and I told him about wrestling. And I said, Dad, I said, we, we went and um, I went up and I watched Brody wrestle for two days. He qualified for state. I said, watch this video. So he sat up and we I held my phone and he's watching it. And he looks at, he looks at me and he says, tell our boy how proud of, I, of him I am and how much I love him. And he laid back down and went to sleep. Um, so people who are going through this, you know, just be patient and understanding and tell them how much you love them. And uh, because you'll have these moments that you'll never forget. And uh, I'll never forget it. And I know Brody never will either. Um, My father had a a substantial impact in all of his grandkids. 
And uh, Brody one day was driving home from taking me to the airport and uh, he saw this car breaking down and it was in the middle of the road. And he's like, what do I do? And he said, what would George do? That was my father. He said, George would get out and he would go push the car. So Brody stopped on State Street, got out, went and pushed the car. He got in the car and he said, Dad, I don't know what happened. But I've never had a feeling like that in my entire life. And I just sobbed because I knew Grandpa was there with me. I think we're all lucky that we know that uh, Grandpa is going to be with us forever. And uh, I was fortunate enough to speak at his funeral. Um, I didn't think I could do it. And I told my mom I didn't think I could do it. And uh, the next day I went up to her house. I said, Mom, I need to speak at Dad's funeral. And she says, I know you do. I've just been waiting for you to come to that realization. And in the, in the going through the talk, one of the things I, you know, talked about is what would George do? I told my family that if we followed George's example and how he lived his life, we'll be just fine because he was an amazing man. So going back to your question about, um, you know, what can we do as a family to help those who are going through these horrible diseases, just be there and just love them, give them a hug, tell them how much you love them. And they feel it. They know. Because it could be gone the next day and you would, I would hate to think that I wasn't there when my dad died and I wasn't able to tell him how much I loved him and how much he meant to me. You've shared some very cherished moments with us today. Um, Brad, I, I appreciate you doing that. I think we've all got the opportunity to kind of step up our game a little bit when it comes to cherishing those moments um, that we have and that we will have. You've made me want to meet your dad. <laughs> Sounds like an incredible guy. Everybody wanted to meet George. <laughs> and it sounds like he was the epitome of a gentleman. And usually when we end the podcast, we always ask our guests what they think it means to be a gentleman. So I think I know your answer is going to be George. So describe to us what you think a gentleman like George does and what he is. I think George is... Uh the kindest man you'd ever meet. You know, like I, I, I think George treated everybody with respect. And I think that's what a true gentleman does is treat people with respect. You know, they love people for who they are. They bring out the best in people. I, mean, I think a true gentleman is somebody who you can follow their example and you'll be a better person because of it. I love that. That's a great answer. That's a good answer. That's the quote for Friday of this podcast, by the way. Yeah. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate your time here, Brad, and, and being so real with us. And uh, you're a very good friend, always will be. Thank you so, so much. The feeling is mutual, Corey. You're a good man. And I uh, admire you and um, have a lot of respect for the person that you are. Thank you, sir. And my father, um, when I would go meet with him, talk to him and ask for advice he had a saying and it was uh, illegitimi non carborundum don't let the bastard wear you down we'll make it a great day <laughs> I like that one <laughs> so on, anyway so I tell my kids that all the time I'm like we'll make it a great day that's awesome and we say that all the time on the podcast I love that yeah Thank you, Brad, for being with us. It means, means the world. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on the Gentleman Project Podcast. Join us next week. I'm Kirk Chug. I'm Corey Moore. Thanks, everyone. Make it a great day.